Heather Cox and Jessica Morgan from the Celebrity Fashion and Pop Culture website, Go Fuck Yourself. And today we're talking with Geraldine Hakewell, who is the star of Ms. Fisher's Modern Murder Mysteries, all about fashion and feminism and about the exciting second season of her show. Hi, Geraldine. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, thanks for, we're so yeah. excited to talk to you about this. I made a very unseemly noise when I saw that the yeah. show was coming back so soon. We're very <laughs> excited. Um, so speaking of the show coming back, we're gonna like go back in time a little bit. And we were wondering, so when you began the first season, like how did, how did you and the writers create your character so that she had shades of Franny, but is very much still her own person? Like she's obviously not like a, a, a Xerox at all. When I came to it, the, the first few episodes had already been written. So she was very much there on the page. And I think um, because the creators of this Miss Fisher also worked with Carrie Greenwood, the novelist of the Miss Fisher books, and knew that sort of energy that she had. And so I think they had a really good sense of the sort of woman that they wanted to create. And so I think it was quite easy for them to then create this person who had shades of that, but was very much her, her own girl. She's sort of this like naive kind of optimist about the world. You're Franny Fisher's niece. I need a good detective right now. I'm more than happy to give it a whirl. The upbringing that she had growing up in this caravan park and moving around a lot and and having a single mother, that, that sort of unusual upbringing gave her this um, license to, to not conform to any of the rigid um, things that society were trying to kind of put on her. Peregrine Fisher, I'm... Ah, Miss Fisher is a private detective. She's assisting me. A private detective? What an interesting life you must lead. Well, it has its moments. Um, it's like she doesn't even realise that... <laughs> <laughs> that that she's not allowed to do something. And I really loved that sort of spontaneity and how kind of wild and sort of carefree she is within herself. And I think Phryne had that and maybe, she, maybe Phryne was just born that way, but I think she sort of had to fight for that a bit more. Whereas I think Peregrine kind of comes to the world with this really like fresh, wide-eyed sort of um, confidence that I really admire, that I definitely don't have, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, but I really like embodying because it makes me more courageous. Um, so I think, you know, she's less refined than her aunt and I think that was really interesting as well. Um, she's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she's, she's not as elegant, perhaps, in certain situations. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your cabin crew here, just letting you know from now on in, it's every girl for herself. Now, where's the champagne, hey? <laughs> hey, <Dad! laughs> She's loony! <laughs> she doesn't know what, how, what the correct way to behave is, whereas Franny, I think, was intentionally pushing against certain types of societal expectations. Peregrine just does without even realizing because that's who she is. She's just being herself. Um, she doesn't understand how perhaps people in the city live. She doesn't understand how money works. She, she <laughs> is, <laughs> I mean, she understands right. how to buy, how to buy things. She's not like bartering goods, but she doesn't understand what it's like to to have money and what kind of responsibility comes with that and what people might expect of her now that she does have money. You know, she's generous and kind, but she's not, um, she doesn't have class barriers within herself. And I think that's what makes her such a good investigator. She's able to kind of go undercover. I hope I don't make a fool of myself. I'm probably not half as good as Lavinia. Lavinia was overrated. I thought you admired her. Oh, no, Pom Pom and I loathed her. But you want that handsome young detective to think we murdered her. And she's also able to communicate with lots of different people because mm -hmm. she sees everybody as a person. She doesn't see them as a certain class or gender or ethnicity. She's just, um, she's like a little kid in some ways, which I just love so much about her. 
it's so fun because it's almost like she's the continuation of the work that Franny's generation was doing, um, which is such a smart way to approach that character. Um, yeah, but obviously, can... as much as we wish Peregrine had gone on a massive shopping spree, giving <laughs> us a montage of clothes, I actually think that's really a cool character trait that she didn't. Um, yeah. But fashion and aesthetics are so much a part of both of the Ms. and Miss Fisher shows. And I'd love to know if there was a particular prop or a particular moment where it really hit you that um, you're you're creating this new show, but you're also really part of a TV legacy in a way. Yeah, it was definitely the moment that I walked into the house for the first time. And um, it was quite emotional. And it wasn't just realizing that it was my aunt's house, because obviously it's a different house to the house that she lived in in the original mm -hmm. series. Mm -hmm. It was the work that the um, that the art department had done. I could see all the details in the props everywhere, um, the, the fabric that was used. It was so meticulously made. That made me very emotional. But then walking into the bedroom and finding her slippers, I think I kneel down and sort of say thank you and those were real feelings it was yeah. it was a really very special moment and you know obviously getting her car and and the gun and the, <laughs> the gun yeah. I, said, I, don't know, I don't know what it says about me but when you held the gun I got a little choked yeah, up we were all very <laughs> yeah hey the, um, the gun's very cool it's very elegant and cool but I think it yeah it was holding those slippers and kind of imagining just like what what a thing to happen to a person to suddenly find yourself with all this with a whole life that's that's not yours but it has been given to you I think for a girl who doesn't have any family to suddenly have the kind of imprint of this person who who is part of her family there I yeah I, I found that very moving and to literally be able to walk in her shoes for a second Exactly, exactly. And then put on all her clothes and drive around in her car and shoot her gun. Right. Well, I mean, who doesn't want to drive around in that car? Let's get, let's get real. Um, oh, it's I think so amazing. Something, I think something I sort of wondered as I watched it, thinking about you, um, you know, as an actor, would you say any of the style of the 60s, like her style, has have you seen any of that like migrate to your own life in any way? Yes. I definitely do a bit more winged eyeliner than I ever have before. <laughs> I've always been partial to a mini skirt and a knee high boot. So um, that is not new for me, but I love how fun the fashion is at that time. And I love, I love the furniture as well. It's such mm -hmm. a fun era aesthetically. They're, they're so playful with shapes and colors and patterns. And I, I've tried to be a bit more outrageous maybe with my um <laughs> with my fashion choices in the spirit of peregrine it's a heightened kind of fantasy of that time i think this show um and so i think i think the mini skirt is very her um but i actually think it's perhaps her eyeshadow <laughs> i think her makeup is a really significant marker of her and it's definitely a big part of how I get into character. <laughs> it takes a long time to apply that face. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess related to that, related to the idea of like getting into character via your makeup, did you do anything specific to get into like the 60s vibe um, to do this role? Like did you read any books? Did you, did you read some, watch movies? Like we would love to know the process of preparing to enter like a period piece. I have always loved movies from this era so there were a few that I watched again um one of the main ones that I think about a lot is Charade which is an Audrey Hepburn Cary Grant film um but there's a few Audrey Hepburn was quite a big inspiration for me for this character because she's got that kind of um similar she's got similar attributes to what we were speaking about earlier about Peregrine that kind of naive optimism and a, a complete fearlessness in confronting people and asking questions. It must have been a terrible thing after all those adventures to suddenly have everything grind to a halt. Who are you? Just someone who likes to get to the bottom of things. And she's also physically very funny and like very much in her body and I really wanted Peregrine to be that, you know. We're both quite like 
slim, lanky people. <laughs> and um, and I wanted to find really good physicality for her. Well, my life just got complicated. Blondes have more fun. Oh, I wouldn't say that. We also, we watched a documentary about Melbourne in the 60s that oh, is cool. sort of in our film archive in Australia. It's a si it's basically silent. I mean there's a there's sort of ambient noise, but there's not really that many interviews. It's more just footage of people kind of going about their days and um you know someone getting up and going to work, the milkman sort of driving the milk to the houses with his little horse and cart. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> you know things that I didn't realize were still happening in the 60s you got to see all the buildings um and what what the melbourne skyline looked like at that time um how people dressed like hints of how they spoke um so that was really helpful to immerse in the world and then um often in the makeup bus we'll put on like a spotify playlist of 60s music <laughs> and just try and kind of get into that vibe because there's such a specific um sound to the music then especially the early 60s it was quite an optimistic time in the world you know the vietnam war hadn't quite started we were coming out of the 50s people were a bit more affluent there was a lightness to it that we really wanted to capture um with this that was i guess is sort of similar to the 20s um that the original series captured um, and I think that's why they specifically chose the early 60s. It's interesting to hear you say that because one thing that this show does really well that I think that uh, the Franny Fisher show also did was, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's interesting murder mysteries, there's good friendships, it's beautiful to look at, but there's a lot of really sort of sneaky point of view in the show. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys don't shy away from issues. Absolutely. I think that's really important for all of us who work on it. Um, you know, it is a slightly heightened fantasy world of Melbourne in the 1960s and we really wanted to have lots of diverse actors in this second season and um, and explore things that perhaps would have been um, kept under wraps more um, in Australia at the time but um, yeah it's it, I think it makes for a more interesting show and I think it's a great opportunity when you're doing a period piece to address the politics of that specific period but also talk to what's happening in the world now um you know this is a quite a light-hearted show even though it's about murder um it's sort of, <laughs> gentle murder <laughs> it's yeah gentle murder light murder um it's trying to make people feel good at the end of the day you want to feel good after you've watched it but um but there's always space to um explore things that are difficult. I was embroidering the last of the wedding napkins in the parlour. Alone? I didn't realise it was common for young ladies to do detective work. Oh, it isn't, but I'm not common. And I think particularly for this show, it was really important for the creators to really focus on um, exploring feminism at that time and what women were going through and um, and tying in each murder so that we explore something different socially each time. Um, and seeing how that affects the main characters and how they change and evolve having gone through that and, and bearing witness to that and experiencing that. We need to talk about our future, about our expectations. And I need to have some conversations with myself about what I want for my life. Yeah, and I mean, I think to touch on something that you actually just brought up, uh, the production, the writing crew for this series has so many women involved. I mm -hmm. mean, from what I can tell looking at IMDb, it's like it seems to be majority female um, in terms of that. Can you speak at all to what it's like to work on a project that is so female focused? Well, it's still unusual, which is a shame. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think it really makes sense for this show because um, she's a female lead, you know, it, it focuses so much on women and their experience. And so it just makes sense that women would be leading the show and um, and creating the content for it. Yeah, it's amazing to be on set and have so many females around. And even our camera department this time, our, our DOP Craig is a man, but 
all his camera department pretty much were women. That's unusual. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so the crew felt very balanced as well. So I hope that it expands so that it's not just women making shows yeah. about women. You know, we can make shows about anybody. And I know that happens, but, um, you know, and that's why I think there's such a push, um, you know, across the board for people to make stories about their own experience and to be involved in storytelling in their own experience. So, you know, nothing about us without us. I think it doesn't mean that you can't write about something else, but, you know, if you're writing a story about a woman, like surely it helps to have a woman as part of the writing team because you bring intimate details that might never have been written about or spoken about um, that nobody could kind of conjure up in their mind. So it just, I think, opens everything up for a, a richer, more detailed story. The crumbs are crumbs. Slim, it's crumbs. No, no, Peregrine, this is not food grade. Most likely highly toxic. Well, it's certainly toxic, making women feel embarrassed about their bodies to sell biscuits. It's revolting. This is a totally left field question, but like, do you ever, I'm sure to imagine what it must feel like to be on a show where we, you're sort of ferreting out murders at every turn. Do you ever find yourself waking up and being like, that's a great idea for a murder, but not in real life. <laughs> but to be like, I'm gonna go in the writer's room and be like, you guys, I've got the peregrine, there's gonna be poison apples. Like, I've got it. <laughs> I don't wake up in the night so much. I mean, that's um, probably healthy. But I, <laughs> but I do, um, I, I, I really love murder mysteries. I'm not so much into true crime. I know a lot of people are into true crime and it, I'm sure it would be helpful for me to listen to more true crime podcasts in terms of coming up with scenarios. But it, to be quite frank, it sort of freaks me out a bit. <laughs> um, but I do, um, I've always loved Agatha Christie and I've always loved the construction of those stories and, and how, how you kind of plant those red herrings along the way and I don't ever come up with like complete scenarios but I do think about little elements that might work um yeah it, it's I think it's so hard to construct it really well and to make it look effortless there's so much maths yes. involved yeah. I think <laughs> um to, to kind of give the audience just enough information so they feel like they're figuring it out, but but so that there's still a twist at the end. I think it's a really delicate yeah, balance. Yeah, I think a brain of mystery would be very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and I don't yeah. know that that's within my skill set, no. uh, but I do love to watch them. <laughs> Speaking of things that are difficult, not in my oh, skill yeah. set, but which you make look easy, I have read in other interviews that you like to do your own stunts where you can. Um, have you... Have you been able to do that? I can think of a particularly memorable entrance in uh, the first episode of right. season one. It's like, about hanging off a chandelier. Right? Like, I mean, loud. haven't we all dreamed of hanging off a chandelier at one point in our lives? Was it <laughs> Yeah. Ah! Who the hell are you? I'm Peregrine Fisher. Does anyone have a ladder? I can tell you it's much more uncomfortable than you would think because... Uh, not only is there not really anywhere for you to sit <laughs> and it's not very big, but you're also in a, well, I was in a harness um, covered by these giant like granny flesh colored underpants under Ooh. my pants. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we get winched up each time and I'm scared oh, no. of heights. So even though I love doing, even though I love doing my own stunts, and I find I'm much braver when I when when someone says action, I feel like I can do anything. But when I'm me, it's like suddenly I'm scared of everything, and heights in particular are my big weakness. So um, it was pretty it was pretty fun. I mean, it's like being on a big swing. I don't love being swung on stuff. So, but again, in the context of the show, it was super fun, and it's really nice actually pushing yourself to do those things because I think it's helped my fear of heights generally in my life. I'm much more confident now than I was when I was younger. Well, they probably don't want their star doing too much stunt right. work. What if something happened to you? You can't like, get They got to protect yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I, I actually, I, I did hurt myself on this second no. season doing a fight sequence. The poor stunt coordinator. <laughs> 
he's so wonderful and so caring and like always has my back. Um, so he, I know he feels terrible about this, but um, we choreographed this fight. I have to fight one of the, the murderers um, in one of the episodes and um, we're like throwing stuff around a room and he's throwing <laughs> me onto a table and I'm pushing stuff off and he threw me onto this bench and we didn't realise in all the rehearsals we'd done we hadn't encountered it, but under the bench was this really solid wooden beam I suppose and for some reason this one take I just oh. slammed my knee oh. into it oh my god as I could, without knowing it was there I thought I'd broken my kneecap and I hadn't and I was fine in a couple of days it was a bit bruised but everything was fine um, and we could keep filming and I and I sort of had a bit of a rest and then we filmed some close-ups <laughs> where I sort of had like an an ice pack strapped to my leg. And like your the other actor was like holding me like, I'm so sorry, are you okay? And I was like, yes. And I'm then fine. Peregrine Fisher spends the rest of the season in a bubble. That's right. Yes. Yeah. In a Very carefully walking down the street. Spoiler. Yeah. Um, speak, speaking of spoilers, yes. so I know we're not, you can't really tell us this, but um, we'd like to talk about your relationship with Steed a bit. And the slow burn is fun. Don't get me wrong, but we really need to know if you guys are going to make out at some point. <laughs> what the people want to know. <laughs> Let's just say it. our relationship moves a lot faster than Friday and Jack. It's a different kind of exploration of a relationship, where they, which I think is really clever. They haven't gone down exactly the same path, but um, there's still a lot of tension. But I don't think you'll be disappointed. There is definitely some yeah, I will say that it's never disappointing <laughs> anyway. You two, there is some A plus <laughs> yeah. romantic gazing happening between the two of you. And it's so, I guess the reason we care so much is like the the way that he looks at you it's is like dreamy. is like you're a miracle and he can't believe he gets to be in your presence and that you exist. <laughs> and it's so satisfying as a viewer because you're like, what a dreamboat. <laughs> Oh, he's very, he's very beautiful. He's a lovely guy. I'm sure when he's looking at me, he's probably thinking about lunch or something, but he's really, he's, it's such a joy to work with him. And um, yeah, we had a lot of fun this season. There's definitely some really good, um, sexy moments. Well, I think that one of the things that's so nice about watching you guys together, as Heather pointed out, is that he does really seem to be delighted by your character's moxie. And he's like so, that like combo of being so buttoned up, but so like clearly tickled by by the moxie is very appealing. Sorry to drag you out of bed before midday. Oh, I'll forgive you. Is this young lady giving you trouble? No. Not yet. Oh, it's beautiful. And I think it's a really um, important part of the show that you see these men who really respect the women around them and um, and give them space to be their full selves. And, you know, he might not entirely understand her sometimes and he might be, like, um, overwhelmed by yeah. her sometimes <laughs> because she's so different to him. But I think he really does delight in in her, like you said, her moxie and her, her spontaneous nature and her intelligence and all the things that we want to be loved for, not just for what she looks like. You take far too many risks. I thought that's what you liked about me. I should get back to the girls. Mm, it's a good idea. You're starting to crack. I hope it hasn't put you off. It would take much more than that. He's in love with her soul, you know, and like who she, the essence of who she is. And I think obviously they're attracted to each other, but there's, but the attraction stems from a meeting of minds and a mutual mm. respect that it's just so, it's so lovely to play. And, you know, we really try to kind of find great banter. And especially in this season, we worked on lots of little like physical moments that we tried to sort of time things at the same time. Or, you know, like I throw his hat at him at one point behind my back and he catches it. Or, you know, I put his hat on his head. There's lots of little, yeah, physical connections that we tried to come up with as well. Um, it That's worked really so well, even after just one episode, that I got mad when her ex-boyfriend showed up. Yeah, me too. It's great TV, and that's exactly what <laughs> I we know. should do. I got <laughs> mad too. Who's this guy? He's like, get no. out. 
Okay. Go away. I could have talked to you all day. Thank you so much I for know. taking this time to share a little bit about the show with us. And we cannot wait to watch season two. Well, it was so lovely to talk to you girls. Thank you so much for having me. And um, everyone can watch it on Acorn TVs. And I really hope that you'll tune in because it's really fun and sexy and fabulous. And there's lots of murder. Stream Ms. Fisher's Modern Murder Mysteries exclusively on Acorn TV.